And so, in order that I can witness the miracle that it is God who is in charge, that it is God who is organizing, that it is God who is speaking through his people, not the pastor only. I mean, we want to hope that he's speaking through me. If he's not, everybody throw up your hands and run out of the church screaming, right? Mass hysteria. <laughs> We've got the wrong guy. <laughs> There's people up in the back, right? I don't know if they're waving just because they finished um, Pastor Stephen Farr bingo already or if because they're running out in hysteria. I'm not sure what's happening up there, but that's okay. There's a reason why we have to let God work in each of our lives individually. Because if God is not working in each of our lives individually, then it is impossible for him to do through us what he would desire to do collectively. It seems counterintuitive, but scripture, Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. What does it say there? For those of you that are viewing online right now, welcome to the Pendleton Adventist Church. If you have been viewing our service from the very beginning, you have no doubtedly witnessed what I'm witnessing. And when you hear what I am about to share with you right now, you will know that what I am sharing is true. God organizes every single part of the service, including the verses that he gives me to share on Sabbath morning, because that special music that we just heard could not have set up the opening remarks in this sermon any better, and I had no idea that they were doing the song at all. No idea. What does it say? For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. It's counterintuitive. And there's a reason why the disciples who were following Jesus were having a hard time. Have any of you ever had a hard time? You know, I, you had that first love experience with Jesus. You made the decision to get baptized. You had the big celebration afterwards. You go out to live life. I've got Jesus now. It's all going to be perfect. Isn't that our experience after that? It's easy from there, right? <laughs> Bentley, <laughs> Bentley just gave me a thumbs down. Now, don't be doing that so quick. You were only baptized a few weeks ago. But the world we're living in is full of strife. It is full of reasons to feel anxious. It is full of things that cause us to doubt. And this was the problem that the disciples had. Jesus had come into the world, and when he came into the world, they were like, oh, yes, finally the Messiah is here. And then in his ministry and in Jesus' life here in this world, he performed miraculous signs and wonders right before the disciples. And they said, ooh, finally, we've got our guy. He is going to lead the charge. Imagine what they were thinking when they realized that Jesus could resurrect the dead. I mean, imagine... If you have a general that's leading men into war and he says, don't worry, we can just go out and we can run right over the battlefield and go right after him. And if anyone dies, I'll come back and get you and resurrect you back to life. Does that change the meaning of the fight? And so from a very human perspective, they're thinking that they have Jesus who is going to be a military leader who is going to lead them in overthrowing their oppressor. Now, it's easy for us to be hard on the disciples, isn't it? But let me ask you a question. How many of you, whether you're viewing online today or you're here in person, how many of you have ever had a moment in your walk with Jesus where you began to doubt Jesus because he didn't do it the way you thought that he should? Oh, but Jesus, I pray. 
Oh, but Jesus, I let you know exactly what needed to happen. Oh, but Jesus, why? Don't you understand, Jesus? There's another text in the Bible. We see here that whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And then we turn in our Bibles to John chapter 15 and verse 13. And we heard it so beautifully sung just moments ago. I can't read the text as beautifully as you just heard it, especially that little solo at the end. That touched my heart. Now, I need to let you know something. When Pastor Farr woke up this morning, I knew that I had to sing a song as part of this sermon. And there's something that happens to you if you um, live in Pendleton, you know this. Around this time of year, what happens to you? Allergies. <laughs> now, little Kittimer was up there bravely doing a special music in church with an upset stomach. But he says, you know what? I'm going in. I got to sing for Jesus today. I got this. So before we were doing a little meeting and a little powwow, and I was like, all right, buddy, you got this. When I woke up this morning, it was not a, something in my stomach. It was something in my throat called dry vocal cords that don't want to do what they're supposed to do. Mm -mm. They're like, pastor, when you got together with Melody to practice the song, vocal cords work great. This morning, allergies say no. Now, you think I'm going to cancel the song? You're crazy. We're going to find a way to sing that song. And the reason we're going to find a way to sing that song is because what we saw so beautifully displayed in this special music is, is that the words to the song are pointing to a Savior that's done something for you and me that is greater than anything that any of us will ever do. Oh, we are inspired by the men and women in our military because we see a reflection of this heart of Christ in the heart of every person who says, I'm willing to leave my home. I'm willing to leave my friends. I'm willing to leave the comforts of the life that I have here to sign up to go. I'm going to go through boot camp. I'm going to go through having that drill sergeant in my face being like drop and give me 50 push-ups right now if you know what's good for you you good for you know and right and it's not like in church right <laughs> and we have so many men and women who have displayed what this text says greater love hath no what than what they would lay down their life for their friends. It's interesting. There's another parallel that I can think about. I remember my brother actually came home one day. My brother Nathan, he might be watching online right now for all I know. But my brother Nathan came home one day. He had just returned from Seattle and he bursts through the front door and by now um he's several years younger than me but he was this much taller than me already <laughs> at 18 <laughs> and he says mom you know what i just did i signed up for the u.s navy the ink is already dry i was sworn in and there ain't nothing you can do about it and he kind of did this ha ha i'm a full-grown man and I made my own decision, and there's nothing you can do about it. And of course, my mother, oh, mother, I love you. She goes into absolute hysteria because Nathan has decided, I am going to serve my country. Now, I've watched. It's been 20 plus years now. In fact, my brother has re-signed and re-signed and re-signed and re-signed. One of the things that I saw him do that was just totally mind-blowing is, is he had just come back from a nine-month debt, nine months overseas. 
and there was one of his fellow sailors whose wife was getting ready to have a child. And they sit, called him into the office and they said, okay, sailor, far as back, it's your turn to go. You're up for dead. When the young man left, my brother goes walking into the office and he looks at the commanding officer and he says, that man's not leaving until he has his child and he gets his two months. I'm going back. And my brother signed the thing, got on the plane, went right back. I've watched as my brother gave nearly 23 years of his life. He's getting ready to go do another nine month debt. During that time, he never got married, never had children, didn't get to buy a house and have the two car garage and all of the things because he has lived his life serving training, working. He believes in his mission. I remember one time he called me on the phone. He says, listen, brother, I, I got a question to ask you. He says, you think the God you believe in loves me? I said, what would make you ask such a silly question? He goes, I've spent the last 20 plus years of my life serving this country and in the line of duty, I've had to put weapons on planes that go places and drop bombs. I've seen things I don't ever wanna to talk to you about. Do you think God can love someone like me? Now in moments like this, it's very important what you say next. And I'm standing there on the phone, kind of at a loss for words because I had never thought about the sacrifice that my brother has made for our country in terms of what it must be like for him in his walk with Jesus. You see, the disciples had reasons for their doubts. After Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and was resurrected, we see of accounts in scripture how Jesus appeared to the disciples and appearance after appearance after appearance after appearance after appearance, the disciples, they're struggling to believe. The Bible says that they doubted. But if you actually look at the word doubt in the Greek, it means something totally different than what we think. You, you see, the disciples didn't doubt that Jesus was who he said he was. They did not doubt that they saw Jesus crucified on the cross. They did not doubt that Jesus had been placed in the tomb, and they did not doubt that Jesus was no longer in the tomb. What they doubted was whether or not the man standing before them claiming to be Jesus was Jesus. Because if you understand the word in the Greek, it means to waver. To waver. To waver. How many of you in your walk with Jesus have ever wavered? How many of you, like my brother, have had a moment when you've said to yourself, is it really true that Jesus paid it all? Is it really true that what Jesus did is good enough for me? Is it really true that if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Is it really true? There's a reason why we struggle to make the decision to lay down our lives. There's a reason why Intuitively speaking, most of us want to do anything that we can to avoid what? Suffering. Nobody wants to suffer. And many of us feel like we are being persecuted or suffering if we have to wait five or ten minutes longer than we want to in the line at Starbucks to get our favorite drink. Many of us feel like we are suffering if something that we want isn't delivered to us fast enough. But what I'm talking about 
in this situation with my brother is I'm talking about a man that's doubting whether or not God loves him based on the decision that he's made to serve and do things. Most of us here today have never had to do or face. I paused for a moment on the phone with my brother and I said, Nathan, I'm not going to pretend to have all the answers, and instead of answering your question, I'm going to ask you a question. What do you suppose makes it possible for me to go week after week, getting up on Tuesday morning and going over to Pendleton Christian School and singing songs with the kids to tell them about Jesus? Nathan, what do you think it is that makes it possible for me on Wednesday nights to show up to the church and lead a Bible study called Peace is an Inside Job with our community so that we can gain tools that help us deal with the issues that we have with our mental health? What do you think it is that makes it possible for me to leave that meeting and walk right over into the library on Wednesday night to have a prayer meeting here at the Pendleton Adventist Church? What do you think it is that makes it possible for me to do this completely free without fear. I said, Nathan, God has called me to preach the word. And God called you to give your life to make it possible so that I can live in a country where I'm free to preach the word. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm telling you something. We all too often approach this thing called following Jesus and believing in him with this. We have religious leaders that have constructed doctrines about everything that we're supposed to believe, think, feel, and how we're supposed to act. But the truth is, friends, we see evidence in Scripture and in Christ's journey and in what he did for us that we don't have all the answers. Oh, friends, the reason why we waver and we doubt is because there are things that you are facing in your individual lives. There's not a single person listening online. There's not a single person listening to the sound of my voice right now. There is not a single person in Pendleton or Pilot Rock that is not facing things in their life that you can't, that it's possible for you to give them an answer as to why they're facing it, and you can just put a little pretty bow and a ribbon on it to let them know this is the way it is. We're going to see more about that in our passage for today. But before we get there, I want to talk to you a little bit about something that is happening in our church. In fact, there are a lot of things happening in our church. Let me see here. We have an eighth grade class uh, graduation. I have a pile of people who are graduating this thick on my desk. It might be why we see a lot of our families that are usually here not here today. They've got kids graduating. Let's say amen for that. We have classes on how you can optimize your brain. One of the classes that's a follow-up to our uh, MindFit series that we recently did. We have um, Child Impact that's going to be coming and doing a Vespers on June 1. And we also have, everybody say thank you, Sandra, for all the inserts in your bulletin. Thank you, Sandra. You pick the thing up, right? And then you have like the leaves of autumn like flying out of the thing. <clears throat> It's like so heavy, I can't pick the bulletin up. You know, I came, came out to get my copy and in preparation for the service, pulled the thing out of the slot and had one arm on the ground, right? You have in your bulletin a sheet of paper with a book cover on it called Revive Us Again by Mark A. Finley. Starting now. Now, why do you think we do so many bulletin inserts? What if this advertisement was just a few lines inside your bulletin? Do you think that we would see it? Now, sometimes Sandra's unhappy that we read the bulletin so closely, right? <laughs> because 
we do find a few mistakes here and there. But the truth is, is she prints that thing in hopes that you will read it because, friends, there are so many amazing, wonderful, beautiful things going on in the Pendleton Adventist Church. Can I get an amen for that? We got men's ministry going full steam ahead. We got women's ministry that's doing a mission for the Philippines. We got our pathfinders that are preparing to go to Oshkosh that are volunteering at our food bank and are doing car washes. And we've got graduations, kids that have been going to our Pendleton Christian School and our high schools and our middle schools and all of this having graduations all over the community. And some of our kids are even heading off to college or graduating from college. Amen. That takes a lot of hard work and determination. And each and every single one of you that are sitting in this church are a part of that journey, aren't you? It takes a village to raise our kids. It takes all of us to create the environment where we can have a Christian school, where we can have a church building, where we have ministries that are meeting the needs of our church members and people in our communities, where we have ministries that are leading our children in the process of not only growing and developing and earning all kinds of honors that are teaching them how to go camping and make fires and do Christian service and preach sermons. I mean, there's an honor for everything in the entire world that you can ever imagine. Don't believe me? Open that Pathfinder catalog and look at all of the honors that you can possibly earn. And then see that one Pathfinder that's been in Pathfinders from the time that he was 12 years old until he was 60 that has a sash this wide <laughs> with honors all down it so big that you can't even see his uniform anymore. And at that moment, you're like, seriously, bro? <laughs> I don't know where you found time for all of that. But one of the inserts that you have in your bulletin is this book by Mark Finley, and it says, starting now, strategic prayer plan initiative. Everyone who chooses a prayer partner will receive a copy of Revive Us Again for them and their par prayer partner. We will be discussing the chapters in our sermons and on Wednesday night at prayer meetings. So pick up your book at prayer meeting, or today, if you fill this out, you'll see on the bottom of this, you will see prayer partner one, prayer partner two. Now, there's a reason. This is the only thing we're asking for. We want you to tell us who you are and the prayer partner you've selected, and you're going to get two copies of the book, one for you and one for your prayer partner. Everybody say amen. Now, I want to tell you, our prayer leader, uh, Rhonda Beers, is going to be in the foyer right after church at the deacon's desk for those of you that bring her one of these with your name and your prayer partner's name and you hand it to her. You're going to get two copies of the books, one for you and your prayer partner until we have zero books. And I would love it if we run out of books. Now, maybe I don't have enough faith, but what we've started with is I think that we had something like 68 copies of the books. We have 50 of them sitting out there. The first 25 prayer teams of two are going to have free copies of Revive Us Again, which is what our sermon is going to be based on. But I'm going to let you know something. If you fill this out and you have a prayer partner, and I don't care if it's someone that comes to our church or is one of our members or it's a neighbor or a friend that you know in our community, if you put your name on one of these sheets of paper and you tell us who your prayer partner is, we are going to order more copies of the books and tell every single person that wants to do this has a copy of the book. Can I get an amen for that? And here's something else I want to tell you. We're not going to charge you even one penny for the book. Amen? <laughs> I know. Every time preachers get up and start initiatives or start asking for evangelism, then we want to shake you down for a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh offering. But that's not happening here. Now, I want to ask you a question. Why are we trying to start a strategic prayer plan in this church? Why are we starting a prayer initiative? Why are we reading the book that says, Revive Us Again? Think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. Well, if we're reading a book called Revive Us Again, what do you think that that indicates? Now, as you guys have heard over the last several minutes, I've explained to all of you all of the wonderful and beautiful things that we have going on in our church, right? Maybe some of you are thinking, Pastor Farr, why do we need another prayer initiative to pray that God will revive us again? And that's okay if you're thinking that. I completely understand. 
But I want to press you with something. You see, when Jesus came and lived in this world and he was walking with his disciples, the same ones that watched him walk out his life in his ministry and perform miracles and heal the sick and feed the hungry and even die on Calvary's tree for you and me, be buried in the tomb, resurrected to life again, and to him, in the same Jesus who appeared to them over a 40-day period of time after his death, these same disciples doubted and wavered after Christ's death. But these same disciples had the same perspective that many of us have here today. We think that if we're having revival in our walk with Jesus, it means that we're having events. It means that we're having ministries, that we're having events, that the church is busy, that everybody has been called by the nominating committee and has five to ten jobs each. We think that revival is all about working really, really, really hard. And it's interesting. When we actually look at what Jesus did for you and me, the greatest work that Jesus ever did started in the Garden of Gethsemane when he fell down on his face, sweating blood out of his pores and praying that prayer. Father, if it be possible, could you take this cup away from me? I want to ask you a question. If in the life of, and ministry of Jesus, Jesus had to get away from the people, get away from the events, get away from the busyness, get away from the ministry activities and the healings and the miracles and the feeding of the people and the men's and the women's ministry and the prayer meeting and the pathfinders and the adventurers. And if Jesus had to get away and be alone with his father in prayer, how much more do we who are living in a moment of earth's history that is steeped with reasons to waver and doubt how much more do we need to be connected in a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with Jesus every single day? You see, friends, Jesus chose primarily in his life and ministry to minister to 12 people. Jesus, in his life and ministry, while he spent many towerless, tireless days and hours and minutes ministering to people, feeding people, healing people, and doing ministry, Jesus, in his ministry, took time to peel away from the people to go up to the mountain or out uh, wherever he went to be alone with God in prayer. And it's from this relationship with God the Father that Jesus had the power and was able to actually walk out his Father in heaven's will. One of the reasons why we're actually trying to encourage all of you to join me in a strategic prayer plan is because often we end up Coming to Jesus, discovering that he's died for our sins, we're blown away that greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends, and we make the decision, okay, Jesus, I'm ready. But the problem is, is that in our walk with God, we end up trying to accomplish what God wants us to do, not through his power, strength, and wisdom, but through our own. The disciples wavered and doubted because they couldn't understand 
why Jesus had done things the way that he did. The disciples gave up because after Jesus' death, they realized that the great commission that he had given them to preach the gospel of the kingdom and all the world as witness to all the nations was something that was insurmountably impossible for them. How many of you are aware of the fact that the disciples not only doubted, not only hesitated to believe, but also gave up on the calling to give the great commission, the gospel to all the world as a witness to all the nations? How many of you are aware of this? It's recorded for us in scripture. First of all, in Matthew 28, 17, we see when Jesus appeared to them on the mount. Jesus appears and he's transfigured before some of his closest disciples and followers. And what does it say? But some of them hesitated. Is that really Jesus? Why did they hesitate? They hesitated because the disciples had given up. The disciples didn't think that Jesus had fulfilled the expectations of what they expected that the Messiah would do. In John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29, we see another example of Jesus appearing to the disciples behind closed doors, and we have Doubting Thomas. Any of you ever hear of Doubting Thomas? Doubting Thomas says, listen, I've got a declaration to make. Unless I actually put my finger in his hands and in his side to see where he's been pierced, I will not believe. Not going to believe. Whoever this is that you say that's appeared to you that says he's Jesus, don't believe it. But we have another example in John chapter 21 that I think is even more important to what it is that I feel God has called me to share with all of you here today. You see, the disciples doubting and wavering had nothing to do with whether or not they had ever at any moment believed in Jesus. How many of us have had moments where we have doubted? Well, friends, I've got good news for you. It's not possible to doubt unless you at one point believed. You see, all of the disciples that were wavering and doubting are people who at moments saw Jesus walk on the water, watched as Jesus broke the bread and the fish and fed 5,000 men and women and children with 12 baskets of food left over. Watched as Jesus went into a room where there was a dead girl, where people, people had been mourning her passing, where Jesus ushered them out. And then later, the girl comes out of the room and sits at the table in her home and has a meal. Is that the same girl? The disciples believed at moments... But in this moment of testing, they were wavering, and there is a reason why they wavered. How many of you think that you know the reason why they wavered? The reason the disciples wavered is the same reason we often waver. We see in John chapter 21 evidence of the fact that Peter, likely, has led the disciples in the decision to give up on their calling and go back to the work that they had been doing before Jesus came. Oh, many of us present here today have had moments in our life where we've said, yes, I decided to follow Jesus. Yes, I decided to get baptized. Yes, I decided to join the church. Yes, I believed at one point that God wanted to use me to be a part of preaching the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations, using my talents, whatever they may be, in any way, shape, or form. But all of us have had moments in our life and our walk with Jesus where we have doubted whether or not we or the church or the people in it 
can really get it done. But friends, when we begin to doubt each other, it reveals something about us as individuals. It means that we've actually begun to doubt not only ourselves, but we've begin, we have begun to waver in our belief in whether or not Jesus, either one has called us, two forgiven us, or three could actually use us to make a difference. We start to see the weight of the calling to preach the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations, and we begin to realize what I shared earlier in this sermon is true. Head knowledge alone will not win people to Jesus. We can preach amazing arguments about doctrines. We can claim that we know everything about God and the Bible and everything about Daniel and Revelation and everything about the things that are going to happen in history right up to the moment that Jesus comes. We can make great arguments about Jesus and about doctrine and about the Bible and about God and we can believe I've got all the answers. And we can spend countless of hundreds of thousands of dollars and we can create hundreds of thousands of events all over the globe to let people know We've got the answers, and oh, by the way, we also keep the Sabbath on Saturday. And there was a group of people present on the earth that kept the Sabbath on Saturday that went to synagogue every single week. And they led the charge in crucifying and killing the one who came to save us. And it's because we believe that the kingdom of God comes through people either having the knowledge or us working really hard to make it happen. You see, one, we doubt whether or not we can actually preach the gospel of the kingdom, the head knowledge, to everybody and get them to agree with our doctrines and our opinions. How many of you are noticing on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and on in Spectrum and everything else that we don't even agree with each other inside the church? Then get out into the world. How many different controversies do we have? If you want to have a very fun afternoon arguing with someone, all you have to do is take a picture of a rock, post the picture online, and say, look, everybody, here, I have a picture of a rock. Within three seconds, someone will say, that's not a rock, it's a stone. So if you want to argue, all you have to do is say something and you can. So number one, we doubt whether or not we can actually preach the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as witness to all the nations because we are starting to realize that I can go and I can grab Caleb and I can say, hey, Caleb, you need to come to my office. We're going to do Bible studies together. We're going to do 27 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're going to get you baptized. And once you have all the answers, good. Now get to work and find somebody else and tell them all the answers. Let me ask you a question. How well is that working? Well, you see, the disciples had figured that out because they had tried to go out and preach and teach. And what was happening is, is they were being beaten, flogged, thrown out in the streets. Even when they were walking with Jesus and Jesus was doing his ministry, they were watching Jesus as he was going and sharing the words of life better than anyone has ever shared them, way better than I will ever share them. And he understood them way better than anyone else here today or watching online ever will. And how were people responding to the words of Jesus? He's healing people. They said, oh no, he's healing people. They're coming back from the dead. He's feeding people. He's solving problems. He's dwelling among the people as one who desires their good. He's actually making a difference and people are starting to follow him. We need to do something about it. I know what we'll do. We'll kill him. The people doubted that they had the ability to preach the gospel of the kingdom in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And here's something else the disciples doubted. I want you to think about this for a moment. Jesus had said, the works that I do and greater works than these you shall also do because I go to my Father. It is better that I go to my Father and I leave you because I send you another, the Holy Spirit, who will be with you and will bring you comfort. It also says that the Holy Spirit will give you power to preach the gospel. We misunderstand the text thinking that preaching the gospel is all about telling people what the Bible means and what all of the answers are and what the doctrines are and the things that they should do and what they should believe in order to be saved. I've got news for you. It is faith in Jesus Christ in a relationship with him. That is the only way to salvation. 
And there is a reason that we know that this is true, because even after all of the objections had become overcome, even after Jesus had appeared and been transfigured on the mountain and had overcome the doubts of some of them, even after he had walked on the road with his disciples and, and they had actually been with him and they felt in their hearts this really was Jesus that we were with when their eyes were opened, even after Jesus had appeared to Downey Thomas and said, here, put your finger in my side, put your fingers in the nail prints in my hands, even after all of this, the disciples walked away from their calling and went back to fishing. And imagine this. I mean, Matthew, the tax collector, couldn't get his job back. I think Luke was a doctor, but he was out there fishing with them too. Some of them had taken demotions from the positions that they had had in society, and they said, well, I guess we're stuck with the sons of thunder and Peter to go out on a boat to fish to try to make our living. And when they went back to fishing, they not only found out that they had doubted their ability to preach the gospel of the kingdom and all the world has witnessed all the nations, and they also didn't believe that they could ever do any of the things that Jesus had done. We can't break bread and feed 5,000 when we only have five loaves and two fishes. We can't pray over dead people and watch them resurrected from the dead. I think it's time to go back to fishing. And what happens? They go fishing. How, well was, how, how successful was their expedition? In John chapter 21, we see the story. We don't have time to go over all of it, but here we see that the disciples had gone out fishing. They had been out all night, and early in the morning as they're coming back to shore, they see someone on the shore. At first, the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus, but what ends up happening? Jesus tells them when they're near the shore that they need to what? Throw the net on the other side. You're not done yet. What happens? They're using a technique for fishing that nobody would ever do. Nobody goes right up to the edge of the shore in their boat, you know, like you're still at the dock. You get in the boat and you're like, okay, guys, we're going fishing today. We haven't even pushed out to the middle of the water where we're likely to let the nets go way down. Now, now let's just throw it right here in the little teeny mud puddle that you could wade into your ankles. Uh, friends, I can look in the water and see there's no fish there. I can only imagine when Jesus says, hey, why don't you throw in the net? I'm thinking, Jesus, this close to the shore, we can look into the water and we can see that, uh, you see, the thing is, is that the reason why the disciples baptized 3,000 in a day after Pentecost was not because the sermon was different. You can go read it in Acts chapter 2. The sermon was the same. Repent. Be baptized. Every one of you, confess Christ and be saved. The sermon was the same. Repent, be baptized by water, and be baptized by the Holy Spirit, every one of you. It was the same. The words were not different. Except for in one way. The words were now being preached by people who had Jesus living in their hearts. And through the Holy Spirit of God, their words now had power. Power to move people in here and connect people from here to here and from here to here. We're not unsuccessful in reaching thousands of people for Jesus because we don't believe that Jesus came and died and was resurrected on the third day. We struggle to reach people for Jesus because we struggle to make the decision instead of seeking to save our own lives and everybody else's 
to humble ourselves and start by laying our lives into Jesus' hands for a relationship with him in which we say, Jesus, what does it look like for your kingdom to come and your will to be done, not mine? Jesus walking on the shore with Peter after he prepared breakfast for them on the shore asks Peter three questions. They're all very the same but different because in Greek you can actually, or in Hebrew you can ask, actually ask someone if they love you in more than one way. I won't take the time to break that all down today because that's not the point of the message, but I will say this three times. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? You see, Peter... He didn't say, Peter, do you have all your doctrine straight now? Peter, do you love me? He didn't say, hey, hey Peter, did you, did you attend church this week? Did you go to synagogue and read Torah? He didn't say that. Peter, do you love me? He didn't say, hey, Peter, when they called you from nominating committee, did you take 10 dogs this time? He said, Peter, do you you love me. Oh, friends, when Jesus comes the second time to take us all home, in the judgment, he's going to say one of two things. Depart from me, I do not know you, or come unto me, good and faithful servant. I got good news for you. Jesus doesn't call us servants anymore. Instead, he calls us friends. He says, listen, I want to make the secrets of my Father and me and the Holy Spirit available to you. I want to lead you into all truth through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to live in and through you. It says in Revelation 3.20, uh, Behold, he is knocking at the door of your hearts, asking, Can I come in? The text for today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and before I read it, I'm going to actually read it in a very interesting version of the Bible. This is a version of the Bible that you read more for devotional purposes than you do for word-for-word -word translation, but I think it does a good job of pointing out why we need a strategic prayer plan in our church. Number one, I want to challenge you to think that maybe the reason we are not reaching thousands of people all over the world for the kingdom, maybe the reason why in our first world countries we are not baptizing thousands like they are in third world countries is because here we are self-sufficient. We know about Jesus. We know about the doctrines. We know about the Sabbath. We know the words. We study them thinking that in them that we have life, but we miss the real power of the gospel is that Jesus died so that through the Holy Spirit, all of us could have a personal, loving, daily walk with Jesus, and that if we have that walk with Jesus as empowered by the Holy Spirit, that we will also know God the Father, and if we know the God the Father, and if we know God who is love, we will end up becoming people who love the people in this world the way Jesus loved us when he came. Greater love hath no man than this. You see, it's perhaps would be easy if I only had to make a momentary decision, yes, I will give my life for Jesus, and then I die. I want to challenge you this morning that it's harder to actually make the decision to die to self and live and allow Jesus to live through you than it is to die. It is harder to die while you're alive so that Jesus can live through you than it is just to make the decision to die for him in a single moment. Because it means throughout your life, you will need to maintain a close relationship with Jesus through prayer. And if we are going to reach people all over the world for Jesus, I want to posit an idea to you. I don't think that we're going to reach people by continuing to tell the entire world that we have all of the right answers and the right doctrines. 
I don't think that we're going to win more people to Jesus and to salvation by running around and telling everyone that we keep Saturday as the Sabbath, and that makes us superior to all other denominations of Christians. People have been hearing us making these arguments for hundreds of years. I think we're going to be successful in reaching people for Jesus and winning them for God when they see in us that God is love, like we say that he is. And friends, <laughs> let me just break it down for you. We have a strategic prayer plan, and I have the hopes that our church will begin to go out into our community and engage with our community in acts of loving kindness and service, no strings attached. I have a hope that we will actually begin like Jesus to go out and dwell among the people as ones who desire their good and show them the love of God with our hands and our feet. But I want to challenge you with something. The reason why we're starting with a strategic prayer plan is because if we don't first make the decision to live our lives daily in prayer and in walking with Jesus, we will not have the love of God for ourselves and we will not be capable of loving our neighbors as ourselves. Friends, many of us actually waver and doubt not because of other people but because of what we see to be true about ourselves in secret. We know about our personal sin. We know about our doubts. We know about our struggles. We know about our problems. We know about the ways that we failed in life that the devil keeps coming back and reminding us, oh, you think you're a Christian? You think you've got it together? You think that you have the answers? Oh, well, look at how you lived your life during this period of time. Look at this mistake you made. Look at that thing you did. Do you really believe that Jesus can save you? Clearly, by your behavior, we know that that's not true. And because we actually doubt that Jesus can save us and loves us, and we don't allow him to love us because we don't enter into daily conversation and time with him, it is impossible that we're ever going to convince anyone in this world that God is love or that he loves them. And so there's a chapter in the Bible that actually agrees with what I'm saying. And I'm going to read it to you in the version of the Bible called The Message. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 Starting in verse 1, most of you know this chapter, and I'm just going to read it to you. It says, If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy but don't love, I am nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all of his mysteries and making everything as plain as day, and if I have faith to say to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and to even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Now, I want us to try something. In this next section, I'm going to change the word love to God and Jesus alternating. Let's start with that. God never gives up. And let me take the liberty of adding two words, on you. Or even maybe some of the people that you've given up on. Jesus cares more for others than for himself. God doesn't want what he doesn't have. Because God has everything. And he's offering it to you. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Jesus doesn't strut. <laughs> I like that. Love doesn't have a swelled head. Love doesn't force itself on others. God doesn't force himself on anyone. It isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. God is not sitting there keeping the score because God the Father is looking at his son who has already made the score. Love. 
It doesn't revel when others grovel. It doesn't take pleasure. It takes pleasure in the, the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth. And what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, when Jesus comes, our incompleteness will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like an infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. Oh, and this is the best part, the last two verses. Hear this. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it all as clearly as God sees us. Isn't that beautiful to think that God actually sees you clearly and still loves you? Knowing him directly just as he knows us is what heaven is all about. But for right now, until that completeness comes, we have three things to do to lead us towards that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and the best of the three is love. Because God is love. I want to show you a t-shirt to drive home a point about the three words that I've just shared with you. Faith, hope, and love. These three will last forever. And the greatest of these is love. I want to challenge you with this idea that faith, hope, and love are all action words that are actually made possible by a fervent prayer life, and a close relationship with Jesus. Because when we pray, we are actually having a conversation with Jesus. When we have a conversation with Jesus, we are actually entering into a relationship with him. And I want to posit for you today that when we lay down our lives and we enter into that relationship with him, we don't lose anything. In fact, we gain everything. But I want to point out something to you through this t-shirt that says the word hope on it. On the back of this shirt, it says that God has actually put us here to serve. And that point is driven home by the text, Mark 10, 45. And I want you to see what the acronym for hope actually means. Now, most of you cannot read what it says on the shirt, but this word hope actually has a word for each letter. It's an acronym. Helping other people everywhere. Hope. Faith, hope, and love. When we enter into a love relationship with Jesus, it causes us to hope. And when we have hope, we end up being used by God to help other people everywhere. And when we love people like that, people who are lost in their fear and doubt have all fear cast out by the love of God revealed through us and they come to faith. And through faith, they experience love, which causes them to hope and which causes them to share love with others, which causes them to hope and to have faith. Faith, hope, and love are action words. Friends, I want to close today's sermon by singing a song for you. There are moments in our life when we are tempted to doubt, but when we begin to understand that everything that is happening to us, happening to us is actually being allowed in order to give us the opportunity to become more Christ-like, 
it takes away a lot of our anxiety and frees us to do what this song says, Jesus, have it all. And I'm not even sure I have the voice to sing it, but I'm going to try anyway. Jesus, have my heart, my will, my soul. Jesus, have my hopes, my dreams, my world. With joy I lay it down. With joy I cast my crowns. Jesus, have it all. To you I bring my praise, my lips, my song, a living sacrifice as one reborn. Your life is now my own. Your will is what I want. Jesus, have it all. Jesus, have it all. Jesus, have it all. To you belongs the praise of all the world. Jesus, have it all. Jesus, have it all. A blessing and all honor, a majesty and no. Jesus, have it all. Jesus, have your church, your love, your bride, the joy for which you freely gave your life, radiant and white, washed and purified, Jesus have us all, Jesus have your worth, your due, your sum, the praise of every nation, tribe and tongue that all that has been made glorify your name Jesus have it all Jesus have it all Jesus have it all to you belongs the glory the praise of all the world Jesus have have it all, Jesus, have it all, a blessing and all honor, a majesty and all, Jesus, have it all. my days, 
Lord, I believe that you are leading us as a church into a season of prayer. Your word tells us that if we will humble ourselves and pray, that you will hear our cry from heaven and you will come and heal our land. Oh, Jesus, we want to enter into a relationship with you that heals us. And we want to be your hands and feet to share your love that will inspire hope. Hope that will inspire others to love and to serve like you. So that we can have faith that Jesus is alive. He is the Lord, the Savior, the lover of every soul in every nation, tribe language and tongue oh jesus have us all and use us all to lead others to you that all who have faith in you will not perish but have life starting now here in this world and in eternity with you when you come again jesus have it all is my prayer in Jesus name amen, amen.